Our animals are such blessings in our lives. Our pets reduce our stress levels, help us to meet people and get out and about, fight our depression, lower our cholesterol, reduce our pain, and even lengthen our lives. Genesis 2.18 tells us that from the very beginning, animals were our God-given companions and helpers. From the magpie's song to the ladybird that lands on your finger, the wagging welcome of our dogs or the warm brush of a cat against our legs, our animals remind us of wonder and love. They remind us of God. As Job says, But ask the animals and they will teach you, the birds of the air and they will tell you. Ask the plants of the earth and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you, Whom among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. In an uncertain and frightening world, pets are a loving family who centre us, and animals remind us that there is more to the world than just work and money. We can see the growing centrality of pets in people's lives by the way they are spending their money today. In 2018, the Commonwealth Bank reported that spending on pets had increased more than 90% in just the previous two years. As well as vet costs, $179 million was spent since 2015 at pet shops. In fact, some of the most pampered pets in Australia live in New South Wales, which alone accounts for 31% of the national pet spend. Pets are being spoiled more and more frequently. And while it's easy to make fun of all of the money that we're spending on pet chefs and pet spas and designer pet clothes, it is also important to consider what all of this spending means. And in a world where one in three women under 30 are now reconsidering having children due to concerns about climate change and the safety of any ch potential children, the phenomenon of the fur baby is not likely to decline anytime soon. So it has never been more important for our churches to connect with people's love for pets. And I hope that this week or next, you will be holding a blessing of the pet service in your church. When I first mentioned these blessing services to ministers in churches who don't currently participate, I often get nervous laughs or jokes about the Vicar of Dibley. But this is serious theological business. By blessing pets, we show that far from being distant and abstract, our faith and our God are in fact deeply involved in the everyday. Blessing Pets shows that God loves and cares for these creatures who are so important in our lives, just as we do. Theologically, by Blessing Pets, we ritually affirm what God has already done in blessing each and every creature. We affirm the cosmic Christ, who is present in and through these animals, who holds them together in each moment, and in whom they live and move and have their being. We have done ourselves a grave disservice by dismissing stories about animals in the Bible as merely for children. Tales like Noah's Ark, Jonah and the Big Fish, and Balaam's Ass are easy to have fun with, but they are also deep wells of important theology. After all, for many of us, one of the first theological questions we will ever ask is about whether we will see a beloved pet in heaven when we die. These questions need to be treated more seriously in our tradition, because how we answer them can change the trajectory of a child's faith and our own. Andrew Root, who visited Australia in August, provides us with a very accessible and interesting introduction to these questions in his book, The Grace of Dogs. Professor David Clough, who also visited this year, goes even deeper examining the systematic theology and ethics of how we treat animals as Christians. If you haven't already listened to his talk from September 8th in this series, I recommend having a look or reading his books on animals, volumes one and two.
Another thing that's really interesting in our tradition is the relationships between saints and animals. While we don't tend to be huge on saints in the Uniting Church, we can still learn from their examples. And one thing that ties them together is how they treated animals. St. John of Chrysostom, 347 AD to 407 AD, said, The saints are exceedingly loving and gentle to mankind and even to brute beasts. Surely we ought to show them a great kindness and gentleness for many reasons, but above all because they are the same origin as ourselves. Basically, what he's reflecting is the fact that one of the ways you knew somebody was a saint in ancient times was by the way they treated animals and by the way that animals loved them and interacted with them. The kindness to animals was a symbol of sainthood and holiness. Of course, one of the reasons why we hold Blessing of the Animals services at this time of year is to honour St Francis of Assisi, whose feast day is traditionally held on the first Sunday in October. St Francis is one of those figures that we also don't take seriously enough. When we are told that he preached the birds, this is not just a figure of speech or a dramatic exercise where he was pretending to speak to the birds while actually focusing on the human audience. St. Francis genuinely thought that birds were worthy of being preached to. He said, My sister birds, you owe much to God, and you must always and in every place give praise to him, for he has given you freedom to wing through the sky, and he has clothed you. You neither sow nor reap, and yet God feeds you and gives you rivers and fountains for your thirst and mountains and valleys for shelter, and tall trees for your nests. And though you neither know how to spin or weave, God dresses you and your children, for the Creator loves you greatly and blesses you abundantly. Therefore, always seek to praise God. Does this idea challenge you? If so, can you reflect on why? R.J. Berry once commented, on just how radical St. Francis of Assisi was by reflecting that the key to an understanding of St. Francis is his belief in the virtue of humility, not merely for the individual, but for man as a species. Francis tried to depose man from his monarchy over creation and set up a democracy of all God's creatures. This idea is still challenging now, even almost 800 years after St. Francis's death. Challenging, but I think something worth reflecting on and mulling over. How might God be calling us today to widen our circles of compassion to all creatures? Something to think about while you're blessing your animals.